Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and its Grow Native program. And today on this very cold, snowy day, at least here in Missouri, we are pleased to present this Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar to you, From Lust to Sand, two of Missouri's rarest prairie communities with Bruce Schutte. And I'd like to introduce Bruce Schutte to you. Bruce is retired from the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, where he worked for more than 36 years as a park naturalist at Quiver River State Park. And there he was involved in natural resource management, natural resource inventory, collections, monitoring, working with researchers and nature education. He has served on the Missouri Prairie Foundation Board of Directors since January of 2000, served as secretary to the, of the board, on the board from 2005 to 2012, and has served for a number of years as vice president of science and management on the board and as chair of our science and management committee. Um, if any of you have any questions for Bruce, please use the Q&A uh, feature. You can see the icon on the bottom of your screen and uh, Bruce will answer those questions at the end of his presentation. So thanks so much for joining us and take it away, Bruce. Thanks, Carol. Um, happy Groundhog's Day to everybody that's watching. Um, I guess it's a, a good day to be inside on a Zoom webinar, the, the way the weather is. Um, I guess one uh, maybe kind of good spot about the weather, though, with this being Groundhog's Day, um, I'm quite sure that uh, the groundhogs, at least here in Missouri, did not come out today or see their shadow. So uh, presumably that's supposed to mean that we have an early spring. So hopefully that will be the case. And maybe this year the groundhog will be a, a pretty good predictor. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the first types of prairie natural communities in Missouri. Um, and we'll be taking a look at some of our MPF prairies and uh, some of the, especially some of the newer uh, ones that we have that are examples of some of these rare uh, prairie communities. And of course, as probably everybody is aware of, at one time, Missouri did have about 15 million acres of prairie. Um, all the yellow that you see on this map was for sure prairie, and probably this is even a little bit of a conservative estimate. So there was a lot of prairie here at one time. But if you look at all the just kind of little red speckles, on the map here, that's all that's left. According to the Missouri Natural Heritage Database, which keeps uh, records of at least the known examples of uh, different types of natural communities, especially the rarer natural communities, these 42,000 acres are what is in the database is still known to exist in Missouri of our tall grass prairies. But even within the rarity of tall grass prairies overall, uh, there are different kinds of prairies. When we look at pictures like this, this is what we probably normally think of as prairies, especially prairies here in Missouri. Um, and so we talk about, yeah, there's 42,000 acres of prairie left. But what we don't oftentimes realize is there are actually different kinds of prairies. And so um, prairies are defined as natural communities. And basically, what do we mean by natural communities? Well, they're assemblages of native flora and fauna that occur together repeatedly under similar physical environmental conditions and disturbance regimes. And that generally these communities, these natural communities are stable systems and they, have, uh, and they are ones that have had minimal negative impact from people since Euro-American settlement. So when we talk about communities, we're referring to the sort of the complete assemblage of plants and animals that are found there. But when we define communities, we generally don't use animals much as far as defining them because animals are usually restricted uh, to different kinds of habitats that are determined by the plants that are growing in that area. So uh, even the rare ones, like for example, the, the regal fritillary butterfly, which is a remnant dependent insect, 
um, only found in prairies, but still it's found there because of certain plant species that are found on the prairie. And if those plants weren't there, the regal fritillary wouldn't be there either. So basically when we're defining our natural communities as in classifying them, we generally go more by the, the plants, the vegetation that's there. And to uh, get an idea of what assemblages of plants we normally expect in different natural communities. Uh, there are um, some ways that we can categorize these. And for Missouri, for uh, many years, since the mid 1970s, Missouri has had a natural area program and the natural area program through several different publications, um, the most recent of which is the Terrestrial Natural Communities of Missouri by Paul Nelson has defined the natural communities that we have in Missouri and that the natural area system then picks examples of to protect as the most, most outstanding examples of those natural communities. So uh, the most recent um, publication is this uh, Terrestrial Natural Communities of Missouri, and that's basically where we get the definitions of what our natural communities are. And so for our prairies, generally some things that go into the classification of prairies by the natural community is what position that natural community has on the landscape, whether or not it's down in the, in the bottoms next to a stream or a river, a riparian corridor, something like that, whether or not it's up on a windswept hilltop. And one example you can see very easily is our Snowball Hill Prairie uh, just south of Kansas City, where in just a matter of about 20 acres, you can go from down at the base of a very moist or mesic slope uh, hill and find plants like this bunch flower growing in abundance. And yet you can just walk right up on top of that hill and you can find a dry limestone prairie that's got plants like this tiny little adder's tongue fern that you normally expect to find in glades here in Missouri, but you can find it on this prairie uh, just up at the top of the hill. So what position on the landscape and kind of therefore what amount of moisture um, is there is one of the ways to define the, the natural community. Another is by the substrate. Usually it's the bedrock uh, that determines the types of soils, how acidic or basic it is, things like that. And so the, the type of bedrock or in some cases, if there's no bedrock like here, where you have windblown lus uh, piling up into large hills of just this um, windblown soil, uh, the substrate uh, is very important for determining what type of prairie community. And then the vegetation structure. Um, because we refer to prairies as a native grassland community, and we also kind of recognize uh, some other communities as being native grasslands because they're largely uh, formed by um, the, the, the structure of the, the plants and whether or not there is an abundant ground cover. So in an open prairie, of course, the ground cover is very abundant. There's virtually no trees. Uh, in, in the natural grassland. But if we add a few trees, uh, like in the middle here at uh, Gay Feather Prairie, you have a bit of what's called a savanna. And so it's basically a prairie, but just with a few scattered trees in it. And then if the trees are a little bit thicker, like on the right, but they're still uh, not very thick, there's still a lot of sunlight getting through the trees and a very abundant ground cover, that uh, we would consider a woodland, but it's also largely a grassland too, because most of the diversity in that system is in the ground cover. So with that in mind on how the, the prairies um, are defined, uh, let's go through the different types of prairie natural communities. And we actually have 12 different types of prairie natural communities here in Missouri. And so the first one is defined by the, the bedrock you find there. It's uh, sandstone or shale prairies. 
And of all the types of prairies in Missouri, this is what we still have the most left. Uh, as you can see uh, in the heritage database, there's almost 18,000 acres of sandstone and shale prairie in Missouri. So the sandstone shale prairie natural community um, basically is underlain by sandstone and shale, as you would uh, imagine. Um, oftentimes there is some of the bedrock exposed, sometimes even small little sandstone glades can occur in this natural community. And with the sandstone and shale um, bedrock, the soils generally are going to be very acidic. The next most common kind of prairie in Missouri is a chert prairie. And chert prairies also have uh, somewhat acidic soil conditions. Um, it's because instead of the sandstone and shale, but there's a lot of chert in the soil. Uh, a lot of times from uh, limestone, you'll get lots of great abundance of chert or chert layers. And so this chert in the soil, and it usually makes the soil pretty gravelly, but it also gives you somewhat acidic um, soil conditions. So this is a chert prairie, and there's uh, almost 9,400 acres of chert prairie in Missouri. Hard pan prairie um, is a little bit different because usually the bedrock's not going to be exposed or that. Um, it usually forms on broad, flat plains uh, in northern Missouri as well as in southern Missouri. Uh, it can have pretty deep soils, maybe somewhat acidic, but what makes this prairie type especially unique is in the subsoil, there's a layer of clay or other material that uh, does not allow water to percolate through very easily and also can restrict um, plant roots and that. And so this kind of soil or this kind of prairie on these broad flat uplands can sometimes in the spring when there's a lot of rain, you can have wet areas, a little bit of ponding on, on these prairies. And then when it dries out in the summer, uh, it can be extremely dry because again, the moisture can't really move through the soil in that. And so it can go from very wet to very dry. And there's just over 8,000 acres of hard pan prairie in our state. Then we come to limestone and dolomite prairies of which there's less than a thousand acres uh, total. Um, and limestone prairies are uh, quite a bit different because they have um, as a bedrock calcareous rocks, limestone and dolomite. And this gives the soils a much more alkaline or basic uh, uh, property. And that can make quite a bit of difference in the flora that you find here. Uh, now, besides limestone and dolomite prairies, there's a couple of the um, sort of wetness factors that come into play. And that's what's referred to as dry mesic, which is just kind of in the middle. That's what most of the prairies are. That's what all the other prairie types, the sandstone and hard pan and chert are all considered dry mesic. Um, but then there's also a little bit, just over 100 acres of dry prairie, which as you can guess is just on a drier side of the spectrum, usually higher up on a hill or a steeper hill. And um, these areas, these dry limestone dolomite prairies can almost be a lot like glades at times. Then we have Lus glacial till prairies, uh, about 2,700 acres. And this is what you find generally in Northern Missouri. Uh, there is still a, some dry mesic prairie, uh, about 2,500 acres scattered across the whole northern part of the, the state. But then there's very little of mesic or much moister uh, less glacial till prairies and 177 acres of a very unique type of prairie called a dry less glacial hill prairie. And we'll be talking much more about that in a few minutes. It um, is what forms the, the very distinctive Luss Hill prairies. Bottomland prairies, which as you can guess, have the, are found in uh, like creeks and 
river bottoms. Uh, they're usually in level, pretty flat floodplains, usually deep soil with good fertility. Um, the soil uh, usually form not from the bedrock, but from just the material carried down by the stream. And there's pretty frequent flooding. Um, and as you can imagine with wet and wet mesic, it's just a little bit difference in how wet they, they are that determines those. And then uh, sand prairie, which is a very unique kind of prairie. Again, we'll be talking much more about this uh, in a few minutes, but it is a unique type of prairie in Missouri that is that really stands out from all of our other prairie types. There's only about 150 acres known. And then prairie swales, which are basically the kind of little draws uh, or depressions that are found in our prairies. Uh, typically, they're part of the, the drainage system. They're the drainage ways that go through our upland prairies. And basically, they're the headwaters of prairie streams. So those are the different kinds of natural prairie communities we find in Missouri, 12 different kinds. And as we rank them here, uh, basically from the most abundant at the top, to the rarest at the bottom. Um, for the next part of the webinar, we're going to be focusing on those three of the four at the bottom, the dry Lusk, Hill, Lusk Glacial Till Prairies, Sand Prairies, and dry Limestone and Dolomite Prairies. Uh, these are ones that uh, the Missouri Prairie Foundation now has examples of all of these types of rare, rare prairie communities here in Missouri. And then we'll especially be focusing on the Lusk, Hill, the Lusk Glacial Till Dry Prairies and the Sand Prairies, uh, because not only are they rare as far as acreage, but they also kind of stand out as two very unique types of prairies uh, that are uh, just quite a bit different than all of our other prairie types, uh, which makes them very unique. And um, since they are rare of, uh, uh, very high conservation significance in protecting them. So here's a map that shows um, our MPF prairies are the little dots. And today we'll mostly be focusing on the green stars, which are our limestone dolomite prairies. Um, and then the blue stars, which are, which is our dry uh, Lusk glacial till prairie, the Lusk Hill prairies and the sand prairie. So starting off with the dry uh, limestone dolomite prairies, um, like I say, almost glade-like in places. This is Rock Hill Prairie that um, we just uh, got this past summer as a land transfer from the Nature Conservancy. And you can see mixed in with sort of typical prairie plants like blazing stars and rattlesnake master and compass plants. You can also see the huge leaves from the prairie dock which is not typically found in prairies in Missouri, only these limestone prairies that are similar to the glades, limestone and dolomite glades that they really prefer. Um, also uh, mixed in with things like the pale purple cone flowers, which we find on most of our types of prairies, but you can find the yellow cone flower, which is primarily a glade species in the Ozarks of Southern Missouri um, and restricted. It's not found in very many places outside of the, the Ozarks and Southern Missouri. Uh, so mostly in glades, but it does occur on these drier limestone dolomite prairies that are kind of glade-like. Snowball Hill that I mentioned uh, before, has at the very top a small example of a dry limestone prairie uh, where you can find things like, um, well, not only the, the ground cherry you see at the right, but um, biscuit root, uh, a very um, remnant dependent species, but one that likes the, the limestone derived soil, and then the little adder's tongue fern on the left. So these are all indicative of that uh, drier limestone or the, the biscuit root and the adder's tongue are indicative of the drier limestone nature of the soil and the prairie. 
And then one of our most recent acquisitions last, last year was um, Shooty Prairie uh, down near Bolivar. And it also um, is a good example of a limestone dolomite prairie kind of bordering on, um, on the dry prairie. Uh, as you can see in these pictures, there's a lot of typical prairie plants, Pacoon, Indian paintbrush, shooting stars, uh, ragged orchids. Uh, it's got New Jersey tea and even uh, a more uncommon relative called red root. Uh, it does um, very fortunately have an example of Mead's milkweed, a small population of Mead's milkweed, which is a federally listed species of plant we have here. But then it's got the more typical glade-like uh, plants that you expect on these limestone prairies. So on this prairie, uh, you can find things like Missouri Evening Primrose. Uh, this is really a classic limestone dolomite glade plant in Missouri. Uh, and again, it points to the sort of glade-like properties of um, these limestone uh, dolomite prairies. Uh, there's Indian turnip. Um, which is a very remnant dependent species. There is the, the Hispid uh, American fever few or wild quinine, a um, little bit different uh, than the more common um, wild quinine or fever few, and uh, somewhat more restricted to the limestone dolomite sites. There is the Missouri brown eyed Susan. Um, one of the most characteristic limestone dolomite glade plants you can find, uh, and it is very abundant on this prairie. There's also the prairie dock we mentioned before uh, that really likes the, the limestone, really needs the limestone. And then uh, once again, mixed in with the purple prairie clovers, you can find this yellow prairie or this yellow excuse me, um, back here mixed in with the pale purple cone flowers is the yellow cone flower. And then uh, you can see here, and it's very abundant on this limestone prairie. So this isn't like the, um, the gray headed cone flower that is yellow. This is actually an echinacea as the pale purple cone flower is, but a different, much more restricted species. And so, uh, while natural communities don't depend on having examples of rare plants on them, they frequently do, especially in prairies because uh, the prairies themselves are so rare, so many of the species are. So um, up until we got these last two prairie types of prairie in the last couple of years, this was a list of all the rare plant species that we had on all of our MPF prairies. Uh, all those other kinds of prairies that we had examples of, or almost all of them that we've got examples of, and that was our list of rare species that were found there. So then uh, a couple years ago, we um, uh, got this Polson Lust Bluff Prairie through the very generous donation of Jim and Judy Polson, uh, donated us this 20 acres with a small example of a lime of a dry Lus glacial till prairie, basically a Lus hill prairie, and you can see right along the top of the bluff, those little openings, that's the prairie itself. Um, so we're very fortunate now to, to have this, and these are very unique sites. Uh, this is looking down from a, a Lus hill prairie. They only occur in the very northwestern part of the state on the hills, on the, on the hills on the um, eastern edge of the Missouri River floodplain. And what happened at farm these, and this is the whole formation of these Lus Hills itself is very unique. And I've heard there's only a couple places in the entire world that have these kinds of Lus formations. And so uh, during the last um, ice age, during the, the period of glaciation, uh, especially the last ice age, as the glaciers were primarily as, as they were melting at the closing of the ice age, you would have huge, well, you would have huge amounts of water with silt from the, that was ground up from the glaciers. So um, the glaciers were melting up north, 
they were sending down huge amounts of um, uh, water from the, from the retreating glaciers. And so you would have the Missouri River running basically from bluff to bluff the entire summer. It was not like an occasional flood. It was bluff to bluff all summer long, carrying down huge amounts of water, but also this ground up small rock material. And uh, here you can see, even though we don't have that same kind of flooding, uh, just a few years ago when the Missouri River was doing some pretty extreme flooding, you can see you know, that a good part of the river floodplain can still be covered in water, but again, nothing like it was. So all summer long, you had these torrents of water coming down. There wouldn't have been any vegetation there. But then during the winter, um, these the water flows would cease as the, the glaciers stopped melting for that year because of the cooling temperatures. And so the water supply would be cut off. The flood would cease. It would go back to the river channel, basically, and it would leave these big flats with all this ground up uh, glacial sediment um, just deposited all over this floodplain. Then you would have the wind, which was coming from the west to the east, and it would pick up this fine ground up glacial material and it would blow it to the east. And actually there's less covering a good part of our landscape. Uh, ways away from the river, almost anywhere in the state, I believe you can find a little bit of less, maybe a couple inches or something on the top of the ground. But here, right next to the river floodplain, these lust deposits built up very deep. Up in Iowa, I believe some places can get up to 180 feet of this lust material. Most of the Lust Hill prairies are in Iowa, on the eastern side of the Missouri River in Iowa. But a tail of it came down into northwest Missouri. Um, originally, maybe a little bit as far down as about Kansas City. Now it's mostly just in the northern two counties, uh, Holt and Atchison County, that there are some remnants left. But um, so here, the Lust built up, I've heard like 60 feet deep or more places. And so you have these hills bordering, this is actually Interstate 29. And if you drive up there on Interstate 29, on the right hand side, on the east side, you'll see these massive big hills. And that's not rock under there. That's just the lust deposits that built up here from uh, the end of the ice age. And this windblown glacial sediment is what we call lust, and that's what formed these hills. And you can even see what looks like little bluffs. And those bluffs are not rock bluffs, that is just the lust. But the lust soil is very unique um, because it was not ground up by water and rounded off. It's kind of angular particles. I think there is a little bit of cementing material. And so you can get this lust that will stay vertical even if you like cut through it or slice through it, like a road cut can go through it and it will maintain this vertical um, surface here. And so these Lust Hill prairies are characteristically very steep and most of them, especially the ones with most of the rare plants, generally formed on the west hand, on the west slope, the west facing slope. And so you have this Lust, it's well drained, it can dry out. Um, it's facing to the west, so it gets direct sunlight. And you get these prairies that formed here that are very, um, well, they're going to be very dry. And because of that, we can find many uh, plants growing here that really you don't normally find until you get out into the midgrass prairie well to the west of here, but you can find them here in Missouri only on these Lust Bluff prairies or Lust Hill prairies. Now, uh, you, do some, you do get some of our more characteristic prairie plants up there too. So prairie or Carolina larkspur and lead plant, they're found on these prairies too, along with some other plants that you would recognize from uh, many of our other prairies. But uh, you do get many different characteristic and because there's such a small amount of it, rare plants 
on these lost hills. So just in the little bit of the prairie that um, Jim and Judy Polson donated to us, the Polson Lust Bluff Prairie, you can find these, this list of rare species in Missouri, rare plant species in Missouri. Uh, there's about uh, 10 of them and you can only, and so this was all of our other rare species from all of our other prairies. When we got the little Lust Bluff Prairie, we added this many species of conservation concern to um, what we know grows in our Missouri Prairie Foundation prairies. So um, some of the, the rare plants that you can find there are ones like this, excuse me, ones like this um, hairy drama. And uh, this is actually a close relative of Cytoats grama that many of you might be familiar with. And in fact, Cytoats grama grows on these prairies. I think these Lust Hill prairies also have a little bit of, or the soils are a little more alkaline. And so um, it will kind of resemble some of the plants you can find on the, the limestone. And so um, you'll find the Cytoats grama here, but also this rare hairy grama. There's Nianther dahlia. Now dahlia is a genus for prairie clovers. And so this Nianther dahlia is a very close relative of our purple and our white prairie clovers that are, are typical prairie plants for us. But this one um, is more typical of the, the mid-grass prairies. And up here, you can see a map of the distribution of the species. And you can see with very few exceptions, it's a species of the mid-grass prairie right down through the middle of the Great Plains. And the only place you'll find it kind of to the east is basically along the Lusk Hills in Iowa and here in Missouri. So this shows a pretty typical pattern of many of these characteristic plants. Uh, that they're common in the Great Plains, but then oftentimes they're not even found immediately to the west of here. They kind of skip over, but they occur in this very unique type of prairie in Northwest Missouri. Uh, a few other examples are this low milk vetch. Kind of the same thing, kind of, Kind of the same thing with its, with its distribution pattern, maybe a little more uh, widely or fills in the gap a little bit more, but you can see a Great Plains species, basically the eastern edge of its range in these Lust Hills. Uh, a very unique one we have up there is called skeleton plant. Um, skeleton plant is well named because this is what it looks like. This is during the summer. Uh, this is presumably about the height of its growing and this is what it looks like. So um, it basically is just always going to look like, like a skeleton. You can see here growing right out of the, the lus on the west facing bluff. And so with the skeleton plant, uh, and again, you can see the range and the map on the top. But uh, you can see uh, a flower on the left-hand picture. That's the skeleton plant's flower. And in fact, I took that picture in Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Uh, when I was by Polson this, uh, early this summer, uh, we, I saw it in bud, but I wasn't able to be there at the right time to catch the flowers open on it. But this is it in North, I believe at Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And that brings up an interesting thing in that a lot of the plants that you can find that are rare here only on the Lust Hill Prairies, but if you go into the Great Plains like Theodore Roosevelt National Park, you can find lots of them there. They're growing all over the place. That's their common, you know, their common species there. But here we're at the very Eastern edge of their range where they can only exist in this very unique prairie type. Now on the right, you can see that little bump on one of the stems. Uh, that is a gall, and I've heard that that is a gall from an insect, which only um, is an association with skeleton plant, nothing else. So, of course, that little insect is um, also probably going to be a very rare species in Missouri because um, it's not on anything else except this rare plant. Uh, but again, it's only there because we have the plant there. 
And then a species that is pretty easy to spot is the um, silvery, sur silvery Serralia. And so this is a close relative of scurfy pea. If you're familiar with scurfy pea, uh, this would be a close relative to that one. Um, it's got the little blue flowers, but what really stands out is that silvery hairiness that's on it, obviously silvery serralia, that's why. And you can see on the hillside, it just really stands out more than most things because of the, the silvery color that it's got. And then um, we come to a plant that is a, again, a rare relative of a common prairie plant that we have. Um, this one is called downy painted cup. And if, and I'm sure everybody is familiar with its close relative because this is a type of paintbrush. This is in the same genus with Indian paintbrush. Uh, but the downy painted cup, instead of the, the bracts, are not actually flowers on Indian paintbrush that are the bright red or in some cases yellow. It's bracts that surround the flower. And in this case, it doesn't have those brightly colored bracts. But uh, you can see the flower here of the downy painted cup. There is also a rare blazing star on the hillside, it's called prairie snake root, but it is a species of liatris. Again, when you go up farther to the west, this is a common one that you see on the prairies, uh, farther west in Kansas and Nebraska and, and that. But uh, here in Missouri, uh, basically restricted to the Lus Hill prairies. And then finally we come to a yucca, the soapweed yucca uh, found up here, um, very unique. This is the same one if you're driving out west on Interstate 70, um, obviously not today, but uh, you go out there at other times of the year and you get out to western, western Kansas and eastern Colorado and you see these yuccas all over the place along the roadside, same thing, except here we only have it on the Lus Hill Prairies. It's a more western species. So the Lus Hill Prairies basically give us a little touch of the midgrass prairie to the west here in Missouri and this narrow little band of um, uh, hill prairies, uh, less than 200 acres worth are all that's left <clears throat> of that rare type of prairie in Missouri. And yet um, a number of years ago, I guess a little over hundred years ago, there was a botanist uh, named Bush who was, uh, went up to actually explore and botanize the Lus Hills of Northwest Missouri. And he recorded almost all these species that are now rare as being very abundant that these knobs were open, um, just said they were almost like they were denuded, just these bald open knobs covered with this kind of mid-grass prairie and basically all these rare prairie species, he said were just abundant on these knobs. So that's the yucca, um, the flowers. Um, also, we hope maybe sometime to see a yucca moth there, uh, a moth that's only found um, on yuccas. And um, it occurs in the Lus Hill Prairie. So hopefully it'll show up on, on some of these also. And again, you can see the distribution of the soapweed yucca. Also on top of the Lus Hill um, is <clears throat> a, a very um, unique site for bur oaks. Uh, there are some big old bur oaks that we have up on top, along the very top um, of the, the hill prairie there. But as you can see, the prairie is going to be very narrow. And so um, because of this, because it is so fragile, uh, up there just on the, the sides and the narrow top of these of the sluss, um, we do have <clears throat> uh, visitation on the Polson Lust Bluff Prairie is restricted <clears throat> to uh, special permission uh, just because it is uh, very fragile. And then also it is extremely steep 
And I would gather that probably this is the only prairie uh, where you could be very seriously hurt by falling off of it. Most of our prairies, falling off of them isn't a problem. But these Lus Hill prairies, uh, falling, out, falling off of one of these sites could be very serious. Okay, so we're now going to go from the rare Lus Hill prairie to sand prairies, but um, we are going to make one little stop for just a minute in northeastern Missouri. There, are, there is one area of sand prairie left in northeastern Missouri along terraces from the uh, Des Moines River. And uh, the sand prairie here, <clears throat> there's only one. It is already protected by the Department of Conservation uh, in a conservation area. And it is, um, while it's a sand prairie, it's interesting in that it has affinities with sand prairies over in Illinois and up in Iowa. And so there are other examples there of sand prairies very similar to this one. But while a few of the same species occur on this sand prairie, uh, the one down here in southeastern Missouri is totally different. So most of the sand prairies remaining in Missouri are down here in the boot heel at the like, upper edge of the boot heel. And while the one in northeast Missouri was protected, uh, up until a year ago, none of the prairies, the sand prairies in southeastern Missouri, the more remnant sand prairies, were protected at all. And these prairies are characterized by being flat, and this is just sand that they're, that they're on. And so, as you can imagine, with the sand, water is going to drain through it and disappear very rapidly. So they're going to be very dry, extremely dry. And they also are going to be very poor in nutrients because there just isn't really much on top of it. It's sand. Excuse me just a second. So um, in uh, this past year, <clears throat> the Missouri Prairie Foundation was able to purchase the Edgar W. Schmidt Sand Prairie. And uh, we were able to do this with a very generous donation <clears throat> um, from the estate of Edgar W. Schmidt, uh, who had funded a lot of our, our prairie work in the past. And when he passed away, um, he left us some funding that we could use to purchase this sand prairie, along with the very generous grant from the Missouri Department of Conservation. And so we were able to purchase, purchase this sand prairie. Now, again, this is a very unique site. It's down here in the boot heel in Southeast Missouri, which has more rainfall than any place else in Missouri, but it's extremely dry. So it's a totally unique system. And actually, uh, the, many years ago before the last, um, um, ice age, you had the Mississippi River actually going down uh, this way, kind of at the base of the Ozark Bluffs. This is Crowley's Ridge down here. Um, this is a gap in it, but basically this was a ridge and the Missouri and the Mississippi River, excuse me, the Mississippi River was down in through here and the ancestral Ohio River came down through here. So this was at one time in the floodplain of the Ohio River, which like rivers do, will deposit lots of sand and stuff full along its way and after floods and, and that. As time went on and through the, <clears throat> through the periods of glaciation, the Mississippi River eventually cut a gap in this ridge and started flowing down this way. And then after that, the Mississippi River actually cut a pretty narrow gap through here. So that gave it its present course, the Mississippi River coming down here, the Ohio River shifted a little bit and it comes into the Mississippi down here. So at one time though, this was part of the river channel moving back and forth and there were these large deposits of sand. And then now the Mississippi River when it floods, will flood through here, but this sand ridge is a little bit higher. 
because it's a little bit higher, it doesn't get the same amount of flooding, the same amount of moisture. It has all this exposed sand. And because of that, we have the sand prairie. Uh, this isn't actually the Edgar Schmidt sand prairie, but it shows how prominent the sand ridges are. This is uh, one of the nearby sand ridges. And you can see that's all sand. You get blowouts, you get small dunes. It's a really kind of wind-shaped sand uh, landscape. So you do get <clears throat> these very dry sand prairies on the sandy ridge, but then also on the sandy ridge, there were channels, little stream channels and stuff, which stayed wet much longer, mostly by intercepting the water table, not by so much water coming over the surface, but the groundwater coming up and flooding these depressions and these channels. So you get um, these kind of wetland areas. Uh, in this case, we have a swale here. And also on the sand prairie, there's this little pond. And the pond isn't like most ponds, again, that catches runoff. It is uh, intercepting the top of the water table. So a very unique system here. And this is what the, the sand prairie boundaries are. We have sand prairie around here. And then we have the pond here with the swale coming down. And so that gives us the two main um, uh, kind of habitats for rare species down there, the sandy terrace, the flat sand prairie, and then also this sandy swale. And so again, these were all the rare species we used to have on MPF prairies. We got Polson, Lus Hill, Lus Bluff Prairie and added these. We got the Edgar W. Schmidt sand prairie and, and, and added all of these. So these sites really stand, <clears throat> really stand out from other um, typical prairies in Missouri because they do have so many rare species there because they're just this very unique type of habitat. So again, this is what a sand prairie is going to look like. It's really just kind of a different animal than what we're used to thinking of when we think of prairies in Missouri. Uh, since it's so dry, you can find uh, prickly pear cactus growing there pretty abundantly. The main grass you find there is split beard blue stem. There are two types of cotton weeds, field cotton weed and slender cotton weed. There is a pacoon there, but this is not the hoary pacoon we find on most of our prairies. This is plains pacoon, a different species of pacoon. Uh, I think it blooms a little bit later. It's more yellow, um, and so it likes these sand prairies. Some other very unique plants found there that are very remnant-dependent, unique species are ones like this uh, snout bean. Very interesting one called Old Plainsman, um, have no idea where it got its name, but it's more of a, it happens to be more of a Western species, uh, but not necessarily just a prairie species, but it occurs there. Uh, in the swale, you can find this meadow beauty. And this is a most interesting plant, I think. It's hard to imagine the common prairie species that this one is a close relative of. This one is a, in the same genus, a close relative of rattlesnake master. This is a very tiny plant. It's called Eryngium prostratum because it only grows in just a very small sprawling kind of mat on the ground. Uh, these flower heads are very tiny, but they do, when you get up close, have a, a very strong resemblance to rattlesnake master. And then one of the unique animals that is found there is the six line race runner. <clears throat> um, they like open areas, whether or not it's an open part of a glade or something. Well, the open sand is ideal for them, so they're here. And there's also the strong possibility of several <clears throat> very rare um, reptiles, amphibians, and um, I would say probably a very good good chance of some very rare uh, sand loving insects that um, we hope to find here in future years. But 
finishing up with the rare species that you can find um, in the sand prairie. Uh, we have uh, this one called dwarf burrhead, very tiny little plant. Uh, this is associated with the wet sand. So this one you're not going to find actually out on a dry sand part of the prairie, but in the swale, uh, this dwarf burrhead, also creeping St. John's wort, a very pretty St. John's wort. Um, and when you look at its distribution, as you can see, it's basically all to the east or southeast. That's one of the unique things <clears throat> about these southeastern sand prairies is that they're not that much related to the sand prairies farther to the north. They're oftentimes actually more um, characteristic of plants found along the Gulf Coast and the southeastern U.S. more so than um, up to the north. Um, we also have actually a rare tree. Uh, some of this sand was really kind of open prairie, but a lot of it also did have some scattered trees on it. And one of them is sand um, hickory. This is a sand hickory. Uh, again, it's only found in just a very small area down in the boot heel area of Missouri. It's kind of unique in that it's got all these little clear scales all over the underside of the leaf. And so uh, the sand hickory is there, um, as is this long on grass, uh, a rare species in Missouri. I don't know if this one actually has another common name or not. Um, it's Aristida desmantha. And so um, a very unique grass that really was found in kind of the barest sandy areas on the prairie. Uh, there's dotted bee balm uh, type of, um, well, it's in the genus Monarda. So it's related to our wild bergamot and, um, and that. Um, but this one with the really pretty kind of yellowish flowers, but lots of spots on them um, is the dotted bee balm. There is the narrow leafed sunflower uh, species. Again, you can see is a southeastern species, not really a prairie species as we normally think of, but again, right across the southeastern corner of Missouri. Uh, the um, pine, bear, pine barren tick tree foil. Uh, this is one that has a typical little small purple flowers of the tick tree foils, the genus Desmodium, but the leaves are very distinctive on it. So um, it's not easy to catch it in flower, but these very distinctive leaves um, show us that it's there in pretty good abundance. Again, you can see kind of a coastal, southeastern coastal species with a little occurrence up here. I think it's also found now in Tennessee in between, but um, just right here in the boot heel, the sand prairies in Missouri. And then one of the most abundant plants on the sand prairie is the American joint weed, um, actually a type of smart weed, the smart weed that you can find in abundance around so many wet areas. Well, this one is actually related to it. Um, so this um, joint weed, uh, and you can see the distribution here, a southern species that just barely gets up here. Um, when it's not in flower, it can almost remind you of little cedar trees starting to grow out in the sand prairie. But it turns out it's just a very interesting foliage of the joint weed. And then uh, we come to one that's called Stylisma. I think it's also called like Patterson's bindweed. Um, this is kind of a vining plant. It's in the morning glory family, um, kind of a vining sprawling plant on the ground on the sand prairie. And so um, hopefully uh, something that um, we can get out of this is that we do have prairies in Missouri. All of our prairies are rare nowadays but we actually have different types of prairies and some of the prairies are even much rarer than just prairies in general. And so the Missouri Prairie Foundation has uh, many um, prairies protected, mostly in Southwestern Missouri because that's where most of the remaining prairies are. But as opportunity, as opportunity presents itself, we have been able to in recent years add two very significant sites, the, kind of 
um, mint grass prairie on the Lus Hills of Northwestern Missouri and the very unique sand prairies uh, in the boot heel of Southeastern Missouri. And so I thank you for your attention and I'll do my best to try and answer any questions. Bruce, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation and gorgeous photos that are especially appealing on such a cold day. There are um, many accolades for you in the chat and question and answer section, um, but there are a number of questions and I will try to get through as many of them as I can. Um, there's a, a, a few questions about some specific species, but um, before I get into that, uh, really interesting question, kind of a devil's advocate question. If many of the species, the plant species that you were talking about, Bruce, if many of them occur in abundance elsewhere, and you know if they're rare in Missouri, why must we be so interested in their conservation within our political boundaries? If we're just a fringe of their overall range, why commit resources to conserving them here in their far frontier? Um, good question. And, uh... But there's a, a number of different aspects to why it is important to protect species, even at the fringe of their range, um, because um, species can have a lot of variability across their range. And um, with this variability, we don't know what traits one population has that might be different from other populations. And so protecting the wide range of genetic variability of a species is very, very important. Not only the, you might say, more similar genetic pattern maybe in one central population, also the genetics of these outlying populations that might have important traits that could be important for the species. Um, and with sort of like the uncertainty of climate change now and things like that. We also find that oftentimes, um, outlying populations uh, given enough time, and in some cases they've had enough time, but sometimes turn out to be actually a different species. When uh, people are able to go in and look more specifically at their genetics and that, sometimes we find out that this outlying population actually was not, you know, is distinctive enough from the main population that it actually deserves to be considered a species in its own right. And then also, of course, if we're trying to protect Missouri's flora and fauna, um, we're looking to protect the entirety of it. Um, even though there might be a lot of them farther to the west, it is very unique that we have that population here. And also in learning about um, biogeography, how might these species have moved around over time and finding a little outlying population here might give us a clue as to past climatic conditions or different things um, that might have been instrumental in the species range um, over time. Thanks, Bruce. Um, there's a question um, also, let me see here about seeds in the seed bank. Let me find that. Um, and someone asked if there's a copy of the map of the pr uh, prairies that the Missouri Prairie Foundation owns that Bruce showed just a slide or two ago. Um, that map is available on the MPF website. If you go to moprairie.org and then um, click on the, in the menu, you'll see where we work. You can find uh, that map and then you can find um, a page about each of the prairies that we own. And there's a, um, go there's a Google Earth map or other map um, and photos and information about each prairie that we own. If we've done um, surveys on those sites, there are links to those surveys and species lists as well. Uh, someone asked, will this video be available to watch again? Yes, it's being recorded and uh, uh, we will get a link to the recording out to you uh, hopefully tomorrow, but it might not be until Friday. Um, Someone asked, do we know if, do you know if Monarda punctata is growing um, on the, on the sand prairie that, and on, on the MDC sand prairie, so the, the sand prairie conservation area that the conservation department owns? Um, yeah, actually, um, that is 
one of the, I think, sort of relatively few plants that is found in both sand prairie areas. Um, there actually are a couple varieties of it, and I'm not positive on the varietal um, status of it, but I know the Monarda punctata is found in the northeastern sand prairies as well as the the southwestern. And actually, I'm not sure that that one might not be found in a few cases, even um, sort of where there's sandy conditions along some of the big rivers too. Thank you. <clears throat> Regarding the seed bank of the less prairies, do we have any idea what seeds might still exist there? And is the restoration potential high on currently woody or shrubby areas of the less hills? Um, I know the, the, well, the conservation department does have a couple um, sand prairies also, and they are working with some private landowners up there on restoration efforts on some of uh, their areas where they had sand or Lus Hill prairies that have gotten overgrown in that. So I know there are some efforts that way. Um, as far as the seed bank, um, I don't really know. It's really kind of hard to tell, you know, if there are other things in the seed bank. Um, both these prairie types do depend on fire, um, probably not as frequently as what we normally think of uh, burning many of our other prairies, but, um, but fire was part of those systems too. Sometimes after a fire, you can see things express themselves that you didn't know were there. So that's certainly a possibility in the future. Um, and we just, you know, it's hard to say for sure what might be in the seed bank um, around there, uh, just like back from the edge a little bit around those big bur oaks. Um, I guess time will tell on that. Thank you. Question again about the Les Hills. How did these plants that you mentioned that are from the Great Plains get to the Eastern Les Hills? Well, we really don't know. I, it's hard to say for sure in, in a lot of cases how plants got to where we're finding them, but oftentimes it's a clue to past climates. Um, after the, the last, the end of the last sort of glacial period, uh, referred to as the Wisconsin glaciation. At the end of that epoch is when uh, a lot of the, you know, the Lus Hills were forming. And that's, you know, kind of when we had these hills form. Um, and we know that the climates at that time, like 12, 15,000 years ago, were much cooler and moister than they are now. And in fact, I think a lot of Missouri was considered to be sort of like a spruce fir woodland or that. Um, but since that time, uh, the climates warmed up and there was especially a time called the hypsothermal period about, I've, I've heard different, peer, you know, different time frames put on it, 8,000 years ago to 6,000 years ago, something like that, something in that period. And it was an especially warm and dry period. And it's felt like that's when um, a lot of the plants from Western areas spread east into Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, uh, places like that that had prairies when the European settlers um, came over. So um, it was probably during that period, of course, remember at that point in time also, there were already Native Americans were living in, uh, living in the region. And so they were all probably already uh, burning the landscape just like they were doing for sure later on. And so with this, at that time period, it's felt like a lot of these Western plants were able to move East. And then what may have happened with some of these is since the end of the hypsothermal period, uh, things had uh, gotten a little bit moister and so um, in many areas, the prairies then kind of retreated. Although again, there were still Indians burning the landscape to maintain the prairies, but uh, it could have been that they extended east. That's as far as they could go during the hypsothermal period. And then after that, uh, perhaps it um, became favorable enough for other plants to outcompete them maybe in like very eastern 
Kansas and Nebraska, uh, the, the western part of the tall grass prairie, but they were able to hang on in these particular sites, kind of refuge sites that for them were a little bit drier, a little bit warmer, a little more direct sunlight. And so they were able to hang on on these uh, kind of refuge spots um, as the climate around them changed a little bit and they just had maintained themselves here. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, a few quick questions, hopefully, on plants. Is sand milkweed found on Missouri sand prairies? And I know I've photographed it there, so I think the answer is yes, but do you want to answer that? Yep, it is there. I have seen it in Northeast too, but yeah, the sand, sand milkweed is on, uh, on our sand prairie. And which of the the cone, the echinacea, the, the coneflower uh, genus, which which species is the pink one in the calcareous prairies? Okay, that's still pallida. Uh, that's the common one in, in all the prairies. But that's an interesting thing kind of related to the genetics question before. At one point in time, it was thought that all the pale purple ones anywhere in Missouri were pallida. Um, and then, um, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, some genetic work found out that the ones on rocky glades in eastern Missouri were a, actually a different species with twice the number of chromosomes. So that one is now called the glade cone flower. So in eastern Missouri, the pale purple is now the glade cone flower, but the one that's out on the prairies in western Missouri is still the pale um, cone flower. And actually, one thing you can do to tell those two apart is you, if you see the color of the pollen when it's in flower, that's, that's an easy distinction with that. Thanks. Um, can, do you know anything about the status of prairie moonwort, which is a fern, but Trichium campestre in Missouri? In the floor of Missouri, it's mentioned it might someday be found in the prairies of northwestern Missouri as it occurs in nearby Iowa. Has anyone found it in our state yet? Is anyone looking? Uh, to my knowledge, nobody has found it in Missouri. I'm a little familiar with the moonworts because I've seen a couple of them out west in Montana in different circumstances, but um, it's a it's related to like rattlesnake fern and grape fern, but it is a very tiny a uh, little relative of those. And just like um, was mentioned, I've heard it's up in Iowa, but I have not heard, and that it could possibly occur in Missouri, but to my knowledge, it's never been found that I've heard of. Thanks. This next question is a pretty big question and probably hard to answer quickly, but maybe you could give a bit of an overview. How does the makeup of the various soil food webs or soil microbiota, how does it vary across different prairie types? Um, I, I don't have an answer for that. And my guess is at this point, probably nobody does, because um, this is a really big question. And it's, um, it's one that uh, a lot of people are very interested in now, but the soil biota is so hard to study uh, that it's only been in recent years when I believe there's been uh, DNA studies and things like that that could provide some clues. But I think it's still largely uh, a big unknown um, the role that all the soil biota plays. I mean, we're sure it's extremely important, but um, it's never been able to be studied that I know of close enough to know, and then also to know how it might vary between types of prairies. So I think that's going to be one that's going to be very important, but something that people are studying for, you know, the future. In fact, uh, last year, a number of our prairies had uh, some soil samples taken to look at just some of those kinds of things. Uh, but I think that's going to be something that's going to be still a ways off before we really understand those kinds of, of relationships. Thank you, Bruce. And we, uh, we do have a number of soil biota, microbiota articles that have been published in the Missouri Prairie Journal that don't necessarily address this question uh, exactly, but they do provide some really good information about prairie soil microbiota in general. And we can provide links to those articles in the email that goes out to registrants along with a record, a link to a recording of Bruce's webinar. Um, maybe, let's see, one other question. Um, when you were talking about uh, 
dry limestone prairies, where, where does a dry limestone prairie end and then a, a limestone glade begin? Because we also have glades, which are like dry prairies, but then we also have, you know, these kind of glade-like prairies. Um, can you comment on that? What makes them different? Um, that's a really good question. And there's prom, you know, a lot of times it would be hard to really draw a single line to differentiate some of the communities. Um, I think probably one thing that's kind of looked at is in some of the limestone prairies, like even some of the drier ones, like Rock Hill Prairie and that, for example, you do still get things like Prairie Blazing Star um, and some of the species like that, that you probably don't typically get on a limestone glade. So, you know, there's probably a little bit, there's, even though it's very similar and probably getting very close, um, the glade's probably going to have more exposed bedrock and, you know, conditions like that than the limestone prairie. Uh, but there's fine lines in there. And, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to separate um, the, the areas exactly. Um, there's um, typically glades are probably more in, well, they usually do have more bedrock. And oftentimes they're going to be more like somewhat smaller openings embedded on a wooded hillside with like dry woodland around it. And then you get these glade openings and the prairies are probably going to be where it's a little more expansive. Uh, but um, there's not, you know, it, it's hard to really separate them. There's a lot of the plants in common. And um, of course, nature doesn't necessarily work to make it easy for us to categorize or classify or pigeonhole um, species or communities. So, so that can be kind of tough. But if it's a smaller area on a wooded hillside, it might be go more towards a glade. And actually there's a lot of ecologists that think glades, consider glades basically as dry or zero limestone prairies. So, um, so there isn't that much difference. Thank you. Um, do, do you have time, Bruce, for just two more questions about Less Hills? And then sure. we'll, um, there's a Less Hill Bluff east of the Mississippi River, north of Columbia, Illinois, across from Carondelet, Missouri or, you know, across from Carondelet, part of St. Louis. The Lus Hill map shown in your presentation seem to indicate this location. Uh, is that associated with a natural prairie there on the east side of the river? Um, I'm not sure about that one in particular, but there are hill prairies in Illinois, um, which are on the same, they would have some similarities with the, the Lus Hill prairies in Northwest Missouri. Um, there, I believe they do have a pretty good cap of LUS uh, on them. Uh, they are on the east side of the Mississippi River, so there would be some similarities with um, the, the way, and there is some pretty good LUS deposits, so there is a lot of similarities in the way that the Mississippi River uh, flooded and then dried up and flooded um, with the, the glacial uh, melting and the lust was piled up there. But I think there may be it's still, I believe, more rock uh, underlying it with more of a lust cap on top of the rock as opposed to just the very large mounds of lust. Um, the, the lust that's found in northern, northwest Missouri and mostly up in Iowa, I believe they refer to it as one of only a couple spots in the world where you find those kind of lust deposits associated with the river and, and that. So I think the ones on the Illinois side have some overall similarities, but um, you know it, it's going to be a little bit more between that and almost like a glady area with a lust cap on top of it, but it would have, um, you know, it's not going to have nearly as many of those really um, mid grass prairie kind of species, but there are some that have that are very nice with a lot of uh, glade and sort of glade slash prairie species on them. Thank you. And uh, the question is, is there more less prairie that might be available to for sale or to protect in future? Um, 
I would say so. I'm not the most familiar with that, um, but there are still, uh, besides the, there's a couple on conservation property. There's actually one that I believe the Nature Conservancy owns. There's one that um, is on the Lust Bluff, it's Lust Bluff National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so there are a couple others protected, and I believe there are still some private ones up there. So there's a possibility. It's just that you never know, you know, if you'll hear about it, they'll come up for sale, if you'll hear about it. And then also one of the things that's a problem on the Lust in the, the Lust Hills there is not only with the lack of fire, the, the trees and that creeping up and taking over from the, the open prairie, but also the Lust itself is actually used in some kinds of construction, I believe. So in some areas, they actually sort of quarry or mine, uh, dig up, dig out the, the Lust along those bluffs. Uh, apparently some was done when they built Interstate 29 that goes up there. And there's still pressure on um, the Lust Hills because of a use for the Lust um, in, in construction or that. So um, there probably are a few, obviously nothing very big, but there probably are a few others. Um, it would be nice to be able to protect some other additional sites. And I guess we'll just have to, you know, that's one reason why it's good if we're ready and able to. So if we find out something like that is coming up for sale, uh, there is maybe a chance that we could acquire it. Thank you so much, Bruce. And um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And um, there's so many nice comments, um, accolades for you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce is um, just a, an absolute gem um, with his knowledge and his amazing photographs. And he's so generous with his time and talents. And we're really grateful for everything that he has contributed to the Prairie Foundation and other conservation endeavors in Missouri. And we also wanna thank all of our members and other supporters whose contributions allow us to purchase and steward these amazing places that are open for all to enjoy. Um, and uh, if you're, so thank you so much. Uh, and if you're not a member, please join us. We will send uh, more information tomorrow about um, some of the topics that were mentioned in Bruce's talk. And also to, do join us February 16, we have another very interesting topic with Dale Blevins, who is also an MPF board member and a retired hydrologist with the U.S. Geologic Survey. He's going to speak about hydrology, um, comparing hydrology of streams and agricultural watersheds and prairie watersheds. And um, so do join us for that and uh, have a, a great evening and be safe in the cold and the snow. Thanks again. And thank you so much, Bruce. Good night, everyone.